Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from a chilly winter in Cape Town. You can see we all have our scarves on and all looking very warm, except for those who are, have got warm air conditioning like Greg and Ivan. Um, the rest of us are, are freezing cold. Um, the, we're very happy, the South African Medical Research Council is very happy to co-host this, um, this event with Lydia, Lydia uh, Ken Cross, who um, is from UCT, she'll introduce herself, and the Progressive Health Forum. And um, the whole aim of this um, uh, webinar is for the Western Cape uh, doctors and physicians and healthcare workers to start to share their experiences um, with 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 COVID nineteen and the experiences in the in in the hospitals and in um in, in some of the community centres and so um, we're very happy to host this and we hope that this uh, seminar will 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 serve to um, support uh, the care of patients all over South Africa. At this stage, I first of all would like to acknowledge all the healthcare workers who are in the front line um, managing uh, COVID and, and, and non-COVID cases in the hospital. It's a very difficult time and we really acknowledge and appreciate all the hard work that you're doing in the front line. We also would like to also at this time acknowledge all the people that have passed um, from COVID-19 and, um, and, and uh, send condolences to, to their family and families, family members and their loved ones. I'm gonna just quickly hand over to Lydia to introduce herself and then um, we will go straight on to uh, the panelists because some of them have to actually get back to ICU. So thank you, thank you first of all panelists for uh, agreeing to, to come on and share your experiences and we really appreciate you taking time out um, and know that you have some of you have to go back into the hospital. Thanks very much, Glenda. Um, so I'm Lydia Kencross, I'm a surgeon at Curtis Care ECT, but really involved in this platform through my work through civil society organizations like the People's Health Movement and the C19 People's Coalition and hearing the stories from the ground from outside of the medical service about how this epidemic is impacting on different communities and specifically how the experience is different depending on where you live, which health system you use and which province you happen to be born in. Um, and so um, seeing that what's unfolding in the Eastern Cape and in Gauteng, I think this is a really important initiative um, to first of all build synergies within our province between the different layers of the service and between different sectors, public, private, district, regional and tertiary, and also to look at how those synergies can be translated as well as the lessons that have been learned to other provinces within the country. So um, I'm not a COVID expert here, but I'm coming from that perspective and, and wel welcome all the panelists. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we're going to start off with Mark Mendelssohn, who is an infectious diseases specialist and head of infectious diseases and HIV medicine at UCT and Krodeskia. Um, and he's going to walk us through the, some of the preparation and, and the experience around this epidemic. Thank you. We can also just, for those who aren't presenting, we can close your videos, that's fine. So thanks very much, um, Lydia and uh, Glenda for the, <coughs> for the um, invitation to present. Can you see my slides, of which there are only six? Which is yes, they're perfect, thanks. Okay, so, yeah, so thanks very much. Um, I, I'm going to just share some um, of our experiences. Um, I'm obviously speaking from um, practice at a, um, a tertiary academic teaching hospital. And I recognize very much the differences between where I sit and where many um, on the call uh, will be practicing. I think what's important is that on the panel we have a number of uh, representatives from different areas of, of work and different uh, types of setting which I think uh, again is important uh, and we learn and I you know the first and most important thing to say is I don't have the answers to this we I can only tell you what we did um, and there were many many good things in that and many bad things I think but at the end of the day um, the, the central issue here is that in Gauteng and Eastern Cape and every other province and the Western Cape, it's the people that are going to get us through this. Uh, and that's really become very evident um, through what we've been through in the, in the last um, few months. And I too would like to really acknowledge everybody across the board 
um, really it's not just in the hospital uh, um, but also outside of the hospital our provincial government our CDC uh, the national government everybody who's played a part in this um, needs to be acknowledged and really is important so as I said the, the three things I just want to touch on and I'm not going to touch on the details of clinical management there are some fantastic clinical guidelines that are available on the NIH, NICD website a lot of work goes into those there are advisories from the essential medicines list around um, the advice on treatment um, I'm very happy to answer on the chat any specific management questions but that's not really what I want to touch on I want to touch on what I consider both successes and failures in building teams in the time in something around timing and then in advocacy so it's now 116 days we calculated so close to four months since this picture was taken and it's the first um, the first swab that was taken on a patient admitted the first admission to Khurti Hospital of a person under investigation into this side room that you can see behind me um, on a single ward. So at this stage there was one single ward, single room in one single ward. And as a, a team we started um, in terms of you can't do this alone, this issue is around the team. So we started this um, through the infectious diseases team and at that stage we had three consultants and two junior doctors. Um, uh, and now, currently, as of today, there are 114 clinicians on the COVID service on the wards. And of course, there are extra ones that does not count the incredible numbers now that are in ICUs, in the emergency unit, in our psychiatry and obstetric departments that have COVID um, wards themselves and patients themselves. But going from, uh, from three, five clinicians to 114 has been a massive expansion. And it's been really very challenging in many respects. But the critical thing I want to drive home here is that for hospitals, uh, certainly for the bigger hospitals, if you think that you can do this just through one department, medicine or whichever you choose, you're gonna, you're gonna come up short. And it's critical as early as you possibly can to get a whole of hospital staffing approach to this epidemic in South Africa. Otherwise, you're gonna be really, really stre uh, stretched and, very, and there's gonna be a lot of problems. Once teams are formed in wards in a situation of an epidemic, and I, I guess this is akin to a war situation, then those teams are very powerful and actually the, the benefit of staying within teams is very strong and I would once we form them in particularly in our acute admissions teams um, there is a bond that's made and on the wards and, and that's an important thing to bear in mind there's going to be a lot of healthcare workers that are off we're now stretched very very thin um, and really through absenteeism but remember that those people will be back um, hopefully to to continue on and then the last thing I think about the actual staffing and teams is that I found it and many have found it incredibly important to have psychological support there's a lot of death we're dealing with and a lot of real stresses going on in terms of um, a, the surge and I think that if you do have departments of psychiatry or if there are counsellors possibly in your service I would definitely use them the second thing is around timing and around um, opening your hospital wards one thing that I think we've done badly is that we haven't been ahead of the curve enough and we tend to um, have, have tended to open new wards and services and beds too late so the suggestion is to be two weeks ahead of the curve and if I could turn back time and listen to some of the people that said this um, I think we'd be again in a better position from that one single cubicle on one ward we now have 256 beds um, we're predominantly on COVID wards but also still on PUI wards. And we opened those, as I said, we opened those wards a little too late. And I think the important point here, again, for the larger hospitals that have emergency units, we reorganized the emergency unit into hot and cold sites too late. We had a hot cubicle where we only allowed five patients at a time. And it basically meant that all the, all the patients had to be directed through directly to the wards. And that basically meant that the wards were acting as an emergency unit and that was pretty disastrous 
now that we have a, a full EU um, side for COVID um, PUIs and confirmed, it's mu running much better. And again, the really difficult thing to set is your limits within and uh, work early with your hospital managers because um, if you out, if you try and open up too much, stretch too thin, then not only patient care is going to be damaged, but the workforce is damaged greatly. And the nursing numbers, remember, are just as critical as the doctors. So the last of those three points was advocacy, and you've got to fight for what you believe in in this epidemic. And there were three areas, I think, that um, touched on this. The first was <coughs> the continued battle around the national testing strategy. This is so important because it would turn around, as you know, with turnaround times that increased because of the backlog. You cannot run hospitals and it impact on patient management properly and the flow of patients in hospitals and make a positive contribution to the public health. A massive amount of resources went into getting rid of the backlog and reducing turnaround times in the Western Cape, which has been successful, but at the probably at the um, uh, at a uh, only at the price of reducing the amount of tests in other provinces and as surge happens elsewhere you're going to need to really look at this testing strategy in each province and try and improve it western cape has been partially successful in this and currently our turnaround times are right but you're going to have to add your voices to the issues around testing strategies i believe the other issue is fighting for the treatment modalities that seem to change outcomes and we are learning this is continuing learning field the first talk i gave and almost everybody gave highlighted that this was a rapidly changing field and it still is so we've note, noted and i'm going to let i'm going to not say much about this because greg's going to talk about it but the real benefit of high flow nasal cannula delivery of oxygen and its decentralization i think that's really something again across the country that needs to be fought for and then lastly the issue of infection prevention we all know how critical PPE is, but being very mindful and taking stock of your PPE, a bit of, uh, of PPE stocks is really important um, and to try and follow national and provincial guidelines. And then really looking at your communal areas because even when people are being treated on the wards and infection prevention control and PPE is really optimized, it's letting the guard down in communal areas where you're getting transfer of this virus and transmission within staff. So having a very strict infection prevention policy is critical. So the last slide is just to say that I believe that there needs to be a little bit more balance now and a line of sight to the future. And the balance I'm talking about is that we're in a state of disaster and the entire focus is on the severity and the death rates and numbers. And the narrative is being missed around what's happening about successes. And when we look at numbers, we look at the number of deaths, but we don't really focus on the number that have been discharged. And of the 13, uh, 1100 odd patients that we've had confirmed with COVID at Hudaskia now over the last few months, 610 are discharged, 220 are still going. And yeah, we've had 200 plus deaths, but I think the narrative needs a tiny bit of balance now. And I think that's important in other provinces as one go forward. And then lastly, we need to, take the benefits and the positives that have come from this and particularly uh, look at them of how we can translate them into a longer term vision and here i'm talking about pandemic preparedness this may be the first of a number of pandemics that come our way we can't again just let this go and once with once it's over hopefully um, just revert to the practice it was before the infection prevention we critically need to to understand that in community and hospitals and the greater partnership with health uh, and of the he of health with the public. So there, I'm going to finish. And as I said, I'm very happy to answer on the chat any questions of clinical management that anyone has, or my other colleagues can. I'm going to stop sharing and thank you for your attention. Ayanda, um, yeah, Ayanda's next. You'll introduce introduce yourself. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I'm just going to just start sharing. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Ayanda Trevor Mguni, um, and I'm going to be essentially speaking 
um, with regards to the COVID-19 experience from a district level hospital perspective. Um, most of these patients are going to be presenting um, to a district level hospital as a first port of call. So I just want to be able to just take you and give you a bit of journey on what we've been, what we've been dealing with. Um, but before I can even move forward, just want to just go back in history and just give us a few background on this, on this hospital that I'm currently at. Um, it started, it opened in uh, 2012, um, currently a 300 bed hospital. Um, the Department of Internal Medicine has got um, about 74 beds, of which the skill set is that of two consultants who have got two medical officers with registrars and interns. Um, we currently don't have any high care ICU facilities um, and there are 12 isolation beds. Now the community of Kailicha um, is afflicted with a high infectious disease burden as well as a non-communicable disease burden as well as a trauma burden. Um, and it's estimated that we are serving a population of close um, to a million, but it, um, and it is more than that, just difficult to quantify. And if we have to look at um, the hospital catchment area and population, you'd appreciate that this hospital serves um, no less than, uh, than, than 10 clinics in the surrounding areas. Now, now, this is where we are currently at the moment. Just want to take, a, take you back on a journey of history um, and looking back on when this hospital was actually commissioned. It was commissioned in 2010. Um, and initially it was a family physician driven model. Um, and over the, over the past 10 years, um, due to the need, um, as well as uh, the, the complexity of disease afflicting this community, um, the Department of Health, as well as the hospital management, um, subsequently increased the skill set to what we call an integrated service model, um, where we essentially now, as you see from 2010, it started with seven family physicians. Um, over the course of almost 10 years, um, we down to, we, we've increased our specialist numbers um, to 13, um, which are, we've got two specialists in, in, each, uh, in, in each major discipline. Now this um, uh, as, is testimony to the faith that the Western Cape Department of Health has um, um, you know, trust, entrusted the hospital management. Um, and then with this slide, basically just to take us through the, the mortality rates of, 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 of Kailicha District Hospital versus the provincial as well as sort of large metro hospital. And you appreciate that beginning early 2012s, we had a low mortality, and that's basically because most of these patients were being referred on and we're not keeping those patients. And subsequently, over the couple of years, from 2015, our, our mortality came up and the investment of the increased number of specialist services um, has borne fruit. And currently at the moment, we've got a 2.5% um, mortality rate. Now, our bed occupancy rate is rapidly increasing and expanding, um, and we're currently sitting close to 120%. Um, now with that background, I'm just going to move back on to um, the procedure, the the, the, the hoards of the day, um, and our COVID summary um, sort of um, issues have been as follows. I mean, uh, in March we had um, 400, uh, or close to 450 admissions, or which stayed around about stable um, in April. However, in May we subsequently um, had uh, close to 650 um, admitted patients, and this is the highest in the history of the hospital. Um, and as of the 20th of June, we are close to 550 um, patients. Um, when we look at our PUI summary, you appreciate that um, in the service within the month of May, we had close to 500 PUIs in our COVID service, of which close to 50% of those um, were COVID positive, um, and uh, the remainder were COVID negative. Um, and when we subsequently have to also throw in the fact that we've got general medical patients that we need into, um, you appreciate that um, over the past month, which is also because of sobering thought, um, is that our general medicine service um, does take a knock. Um, it will be difficult to adequately manage during a pandemic. But you can see that we've had 200 patients, which now subsequently we are de declining. And I think that's obviously uh, gives us an indication of, of, of what's happening to our general medical population and whether they are able to access healthcare during the lockdown. Um, when we move on to our exit strategy, we've had a lot of number of deaths um, and as Prof Professor Mark Mendelson has alluded to, we are dealing with a lot of deaths um, and they're coming thick and fast uh, and this is going to happen. Um, and we, know that we do know that in our hospital, our mortuary at one time was, was completely full. Um, and uh, I think what's also important with us, you would appreciate that even though we had you know, close to 250 um, COVID positive patients in the service, a considerable number of patients in May, we subsequently were able to, to, to transfer to Tiger Brook Hospital. Um, and uh, out of those patients, uh, 90 80 to 90 percent of them were COVID related. Um, we subsequently were able to, um, able to organize our service uh, as we're learning as the pandemic evolves. Um, and uh, from, from the, as of last month, we were able to sort of uh, keep more of these patients um, and, and manage and just get a feel, feel for them. 
Now I'm going to quickly just move on to the challenges that we have um, and um, yeah, just to avoid repetition, but the big challenges that we've had it from a, from a district level hospital is, is that of infrastructure. You can imagine when you've got close to 500 PUIs, it's going to lead to overcrowded ECs. You're not going to have enough beds. And you can, I cannot overstate the issue of um, infection prevention control um, and the lack of isolation rooms. Um, and then um, with also with the infrastructure challenges, we know that we have a limited ability to offer high flow nasal flow oxygen. Again, I'm not going to talk much about that. Um, and uh, due to the expanded NICD criteria um, as part of the pandemic in the beginning of May, end of April, May, um, that obviously created a huge backlog in the lab, which had significant delays and turnaround time for our results. We've also had a, a considerable number of healthcare workers who've been infected, um, and um, the nurses have been uh, quite, we're, we're quite. I mean, we, in in general, we do run um, low numbers of calls to nurses, um, and majority of our nurses are, you know, patients themselves um, with diabetes and hypertension who will get COVID. Your cleaners will get COVID as well as your porters. And this is all quite important because when you lose your porters, your whole service, your whole services and your management and movement of patients is hardly affected. But with our radiographers uh, testing positive, we were unable to actually access some of our radiology service. And then subsequently translated to our lab staff who tested positive and ultimately to our doctors. I think from a district level hospital, the biggest challenge we've also had is that of our emergency medical um, services. Um, you can understand that we are sort of all fishing from the same pool with regards to these services. Um, and it becomes quite challenging and quite competitive during a pandemic. Now, the way we've moved on to try and addressing these challenges, um, I cannot under, understate the considerable support that we've been uh, getting from Tigerberg Hospital, um, particularly the Department of Internal Medicine, um, as well as our ICU colleagues um, they, in the form of outreach. Um, Dr. Schroeder comes along and does a, a ward round himself. Um, human resources, we get extra interns from Tigerberg to try and boost our service and our human resource response, um, as well as the efficient referral and, and, and transfer of our moderately to severely critically ill patients. Um, and with regards to um, the human resource and infrastructure challenge, um, we've had to mobilize um, staff from other disciplines. And I think I echo the points that Professor Mendelssohn has just made now, that we cannot do this alone. Um, and we subsequently have, 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 have had to do that. We've taken over additional wards and we're currently looking after 194 beds. Um, and uh, as of a month ago, we were quite fortunate to partner with MSF, with uh, a, a field hospital, which is literally a stone throws away from the hospital. Um, and as of uh, mid-June, uh, we are using, we are accessing the con uh, Cape Town Interventional Conservation um, Centre platform. Um, I'm just going to take you through two um, cases which illustrate the disease spectrum that we see at Kailicha District Hospital um, and, and, and as well as obviously the other complications that we might get. Um, this is the first case is a 54-year-old gentleman who's got poorly controlled diabetes with an HbA1c A1C of 12.9%, who's hypertensive, who's morbidly obese, um, and he presented with Um, you were severely hypoxemic, he was in type 1 respiratory failure, um, and um, his uh, PF ratio was um, 65 milligrams of mercury, um, and that's in uh, sort of Berlin criteria, was in keeping with the severe ARDS picture. His CRP was 335, was HIV negative, and he tested um, SARS-CoV-2 positive. Now, just to highlight again the difficulties and the challenges that we had, I mean, I review this gentleman at quarter past two in the afternoon, diagnosis was made of a severe COVID pneumonia. He was anticoagulated, he was started on hard as prednisone, he was discussed with our ICU colleagues, um, he was accepted and, and the bed was booked. However, six hours later, we still had no ambulance, he clinically deteriorated um, as well as biochemically and we subsequently intubated and ventilated. He was only able to transfer him at quarter past four the following day. His post-intubation x-ray um, confirmed with an ARDS picture. Um, the second case again highlights the infectious diseases burden that we, will, that we, we are seeing in terms of COVID. Um, and this is a 27 year old lady who's HIV positive, um, who's uh, got a CD4 count of 274 uh, four years ago, subsequently defaulted. She doesn't give any history of any opportunistic infections. And her main complaints was that of uh, minor hemoptysis. Associated with this was a, a two, two, two week history of a right sided pleuritic chest pain as well as constitutional symptoms. She had an abnormal chest x ray essentially we had a cavitatory pneumonia in the right upper lobe. She tested SARS-CoV-2 positive. She also tested um, gene expert was positive for PCR for, for tuberculosis, which was drug sensitive. 
We subsequently started on broad um, spectrum antibiotics um, as well as um, RIFA4. However, she had ongoing hemoptysis um, and had dropped the HP over two days. We subsequently decided um, to, re to do a chest, uh, a CT scan of her chest. And there what we found was um, essentially a ground glass picture, which is in keeping with uh, essentially probably COVID. Um, and then a nodular infiltrate um, with the yellow mustard arrow, as well as tree and nodularity. And on top of that, she had a cavity um, with a, a aspergilloma. And the last case I also just want to highlight, and this was a good outcome that we had, um, was a 29-year-old lady, again, who was HIV positive. Um, she's virally suppressed. She's on ARVs with a low CD4 count. She's had previous TB twice. Um, and she subsequently has presented again with an acute history of a cough, fever, myalgia, as well as shortness of breath. She, she had also grossly abnormal chest X-ray. And this is common what we see in COVID, bilateral um, ground glass opacity with mid to lower zone involvement. What was atypical in this space was that she's got diffuse bilateral consolidation. Again, she has also had uh, quite severe hypoxemia was in respiratory failure. She had a PF of 130, and that was in keeping with a moderate ARDS. She had a CRP of 482 and a DDAM of 2.53. Of um, and again, with her, essentially the concern with the wide differential, we, we elected to start on antibiotics. But based on a CT scan, there was concern that this is what's atypical for COVID or any other opportunistic infection that this patient might be exposed to. And we started to um, actually, we know, we looked for a unifying diagnosis and the di unifying diagnosis we thought about was that of an interstitial lung disease in the form of an organizing pneumonia. Subsequently, she was started on high dose prednisone with a repeat chest X-ray in a week. And just to take you through her CT scan again, confirming that she had bilateral um, consolidation, um, pulmonary vascular disease was excluded by the meningitis views. A week later on prednisone, um, she had a com almost a, a, a complete resolution of a pulmonary infiltrates and we subsequently was able to be discharged home. So I think, you know, as a take home message, what we'd like to highlight is that um, perfection is the enemy of good. Um, we've tried a lot of things and some of the things have not worked. I think it's important to realize that it's okay to, to fail, um, but uh, that shouldn't be um, a barrier to trying new things and understanding that you need to change. It's an evolving situation. Um, and uh, I think each hospital is going to need to maximize all the available uh, physical space. Um, I cannot um, uh, overestimate the rational use of PPE. PPE is um, a, scarce, a scarce resource. Um, and there's a lot of protocols out there um, which are there to uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, guide people into what type of PPE to use and exactly when. Um, and I think what's important is that the response to this pandemic is hospital driven. And yes, internal medicine, majority of cases is going to shoulder most of the responsibility, but it needs buy-in from all departments. And as again, we just want to echo the point that no one can do this alone. Um, and teamwork within a hospital as well, into hospitals um, is quite crucial. Any collaborations that anybody can form, I think is important. Um, and I think what, what's other important moving forward is a, st a strategic allocation of leave for staff. Um, everybody's going to be working quite hard for a very long period of time. And I think we need to pay an attention and address to that. And again, I cannot, uh, of again, that we need to pay attention to our mental health staff, uh, to the mental health state of our, st of our staff. So in, fin in summary, and just, I just want to acknowledge, I mean, there's no way that I can, we can run this department on my own. Um, and I just want to thank quite a few people who have been instrumental. I think our hospital management has been absolutely fantastic um, in providing us with the support. We've got an excellent clinical manager. Um, I'd like to also thank um, Dr. Sibir Gordon Burton, who are my co-consultant, who are uh, sharing the load with me. Um, I'd like to make a special mention to Tigerberg Internal Medicine, um, in particular, um, Dr. Nishad Shuda, who is also the level two head, um, and for his unwavering support, um, not just for COVID, but also pre-COVID, um, as well as the executive head of Internal Medicine at Tigerberg Hospital, Professor Musa. I'd like to also thank our emergency unit physicians and teams who are also excellent, who will function as, um, as one unit. Um, the stats that I showed you is just the stats on the patients that we had to admit, but there are a considerable number of patients which are transferred from our emergency unit um, to ICUs. Um, and I've had fantastic support from um, amazing medical officers as well as medical registrars and interns um, and uh, MSF. I just want to thank you. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thanks, Ayanda. Greg, I think you're next. Thank you. Um, let me just share my, get my slides up. 
Okay, can everybody see are my slides up? Yeah, they're perfect. Great. All right, so I'm going to be talking about high flow nasal cannula um, or high flow nasal oxygen as a therapy for respiratory failure in COVID 19 pneumonia. And um, this is not something that's new in respiratory failure, but I think in anticipation that um, ICU beds might be full for months and that we were going to be um, overcome with, a, with a, a wave of patients needing respiratory support. Um, we thought we would look at other non-invasive means of um, uh, respiratory support. And this is actually a slide from the Critical Care Society of South Africa saying that um, other strategies to improve oxygenation of COVID-19 patients pre-ICU was something that needed to be looked at. Um, and in fact, it was Kuni Kuklenberg and Usha Lalu who first trialed this at uh, Tigerberg Hospital and they, they published um, their early experiences in the South African Medical Journal. But for those of you who don't know, I mean, high flow nasal cannulas is, is actually quite a, a simple setup. Um, it's really just a machine that blends oxygen from the wall with room air to provide a certain flow rate. And really the innovation is that it's got a water chamber with a humidifier and warmer attached to it. So it's able to provide large flows of warmed and humidified gas, which otherwise wouldn't be able to be tolerated by patients. There was a concern that uh, using these very high flows of gas would uh, cause aerosolization, but I think that risk seems to have been overstated. And certainly there's quite a lot of experimental data showing that the amount of aerosolization from high flow is much less than um, uh, 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 what comes from even a, a normal 40% face mask. Now, how it works is probably um, a little bit beyond the time frame that I've been given, but essentially by providing these high volumes of gas, it washes out the anatomical and physiological dead space of the conducting airways and moves the oxygen reservoir to deep within the chest um, and limits the amount of dilution that happens with inspired oxygen um, as a consequence of exhaled breath. So um, that's its main mechanism. It also provides a little bit of PEEP and it helps to reduce the work of breathing. So how we've been managing this at Critiscare? Well, um, we've thought of this as an intervention that occurs pre-ICU. Um, at Critiscare, only ventilated patients are admitted to the, the, the intensive care unit. So this is something we've been doing in the COVID wards. And um, we've cohorted them in, in what we call the high care areas of the ward. Um, but it's important that it's not, it's a high care in name only, and we're not drawing on uh, nursing ratios that are compatible with high care. So it's essentially the general medical wards. The monitoring is really just with pulse oximetry. Um, because we've cohorted patients in the general ward, we, we feel that, uh, you know, PPE needs to be worn. Um, the requirement for monitoring is, is also less than ICU, and we find that blood gas monitoring, sometimes a venous blood gas, just looking at the CO2 and the pH in patients that you feel are tiring can be helpful. Um, and what we really uh, have struggled with, and uh, I don't think there's a good answer for this, is trying to have very defined parameters for patients that require intubation. I mean, anybody who manages patients with severe COVID pneumonia will know that the numbers, so the PO2 or the SATs, are often um, not good predictors of how a patient's doing. And we've all been confronted with someone who has got SATs in the low 80s, um, but is comfortably messaging on their phone um, and, and resting in bed. So, th so the actual conventional measures of oxygenation are not really that reliable. And we've gone much more by a feel of the patient's respiratory effort and their respiratory rate and uh, whether the clinical impression is one of impending exhaustion. How do we do that practically? Um, well, um, the, the machines are designed to flow at up to 60 liters a minute, but that provides a certain um, FiO2. Um, so if, if you reduce the flow rate, um, the overall flow rate, which is the denominator, you can um, uh, increase the uh, FiO2, and, and that's just a strategy to conserve oxygen supplies. One of the big advantages of high flow is that it allows the patients to eat and drink as opposed to some other forms of non-invasive ventilation like BiPAP or CPAP, where there's quite a tight fitting facial mask um, or, ma or facial interface, which is often uncomfortable. Um, and also they can wear a face mask, a normal surgical face mask over the high flow cannulae. Um, and that does provide um, something in the way of IPC. 
So what, what are our indications of critter scare? Well, in patients who have either got confirmed or as the pandemic has progressed and we've become better at spotting them, uh, patients who uh, we really think have got COVID-19 pneumonia, um, we uh, use a pulse oximetry of less than 92% despite oxygen via a reservoir as a uh, trigger um, to consider high flow. And generally we've reserved it for awake cooperative patients um, with single organ failure who are also able to cooperate with awake self-proning, which I'm sure most of you know is another strategy that's been used to improve oxygenation in COVID. Contraindications are hemodynamic instability and altered mental status. And this is a modification of the oxygen ladder that um, has been published in other guidelines. Um, and really, we've just said that patients who are on a, a reservoir mask at 50 liters a minute be considered for high flow if their SATs aren't above 92%. Just a snapshot of um, some of the demographics of the patients we've been treating. Um, as I said, um, we are um, uh, looking at this in a bit more detail, but this is from a preliminary analysis we did of about 139 patients. And really the striking feature is the severity of the respiratory failure. So those of you who look after patients in ICU will know that the PF ratios, the ratio of the arterial partial pressure of oxygen to the inspired fraction of oxygen is a measure of the severity of the gas exchange abnormality. And anything less than 300 is considered ARDS. So um, this is, a, this is a, a significant uh, impairment in oxygenation. Less than 100 is considered severe ARDS, and most of the literature um, has cohorts of uh, uh, PF ratios of about 100 to 120. So this is in, in non-COVID ARDS. And this group of patients that were treated with non-invasive ventilation in the general medical wards have got a median PF ratio of about 64. And I know it's very similar in the Tiger Bird cohort. So it's an extremely sick group of patients that four months ago would have been intubated and ventilated without a second thought. Um, but really because of the, the amount of patients uh, that we confronted with and, and the strain on ICU resources, high flow is a strategy um, to treat these patients in the pre-ICU setting. Um, these are our, our preliminary outcomes. Um, I will point out that Tigerberg have uh, pioneered this by treating patients in the ICU themselves. I mean, clearly that comes with some advantages. Um, ICU admission also represents a, a, a certain um, kind of uh, entry bar um, for these patients. But um, having a, had a brief look at their demographics, and this is uh, something that we're collaborating with, I can confirm that they're an equally sick group of patients. Um, and you can see there that the number of patients or the proportion of patients that are successfully treated with this modality varies between about 34 and about 60%. So overall, about a 50% success rate, bearing in mind that uh, patients are being treated in ICU versus non-ICU between the two hospitals. Um, so it is a potential therapy. What is the cost? Well, the units themselves cost about 50,000 Rand. Um, the disposables are actually between about one and, and currently 3,000 Rand per patient, depending on the brand. And the average duration of use is not short. So in patients who fail and require intubation, certainly in our setting, the median um, use was about two days. But in patients who survive, the median um, time that they're on a high flow is about eight days. So even in survivors, you know, they're going to be committed to this therapy for not an insignificant number of days. And of course, these costs have to be balanced against the cost of the ICU resource. What are the advantages? Well, unlike intubation, so, so when you're confronted with a very hypoxemic patient, um, intubation of a COVID patient um, is something that comes with a considerable amount of anxiety on, on the part of the treating doctor. I mean, we're very lucky to have an airway team at our hospital. High flow, on the other hand, is not a complex therapy. It's literally something that anyone can be taught to put on. And as a temporizing measure in a sick patient, it's, it's very attractive while you're making decisions about ICU care or perhaps while you're alerting your airway team if you have one. I can't say that it's a cheap therapy, but it's certainly cheaper than intensive care. Um, and there's an initial outlay and the consumable costs per patient, I think are quite reasonable. Um, importantly, it's a low resource nursing uh, uh, procedure. So we haven't really um, um, had to increase the amount of nurses um, when offering this therapy. 
although clearly the fact that outcomes are, are better when these patients are managed in ICU must mean that um, there's a certain level of care uh, that, that those patients are receiving that may be advantageous. What are the disadvantages? Well, it uses a, a lot of oxygen, so you need some kind of understanding of the oxygen infrastructure at your hospital, both in terms of the overall supply, so the overall capacity, but also an understanding of the reticulation, so the diameter of the pipes in the individual bed heads where you're hoping to offer this therapy. And then lastly, just to stress that it's an adjunct um, to the treatment of COVID-19 pneumonia and isn't really, uh, I don't think, established as a substitute for invasive ventilation. And I think it represents a, con con uh, a continuum of care. And uh, Ivan will speak about our ICU experience after this. And um, when I say we talk about a lot of oxygen, and um, this is a graph looking at uh, the oxygen consumption at Tigerberg and at uh, Kretuske in, in the last couple of weeks. I've cut off the x-axis just to get, to, uh, get it to fit on the slide, but we're starting in about mid-May and, and the, the last data points are a, a couple of days ago. And you can see the stepwise increases in oxygen usage um, as different batches of high-flow nasal cannula machines were delivered to our hospital. And this is something that really has to be uh, considered based on your setting and the oxygen supply chain. So if I can just summarize, and hopefully I've caught up a little bit on time, um, high-flow nasal cannulae is an alternative, albeit imperfect, to intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, our data show that if we treat patients with severe ARDS, so patients that would otherwise have been ventilated without a second thought a few months ago with high-flow nasal cannulae outside the ICU, we will save at least one in three lives. And obviously this is at much lower cost than ICU. Um, survivors require the therapy for over a week on average. So um, you must be cognizant of the fact that um, patients are gonna stay in a high flow bed for a certain length of time. And um, one of the real struggles for me personally is um, knowing where the threshold for intubation is. I mean, this is not well defined and most of the physiological parameters are far in excess of what we used to. Um, the aerosolization risk of, of half flow nasal cannula therapy is likely overstating, overstated, but cohorting might be a, a, a good um, strategy. Um, and I've mentioned some of the considerations regarding oxygen supply. The, the last outstanding question is really to understand the predictors of uh, half flow nasal cannula failure ab initio, so up front, um, and we're busy analyzing our data and hopefully we'll, we'll present um, uh, on, on this topic soon. Lastly, just to acknowledge uh, the team at Critis Care, which I think uh, Mark has already done, and also Kuni Kuklenberg, Usha Lalu, and uh, their team at Tigerberg for the collaboration. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much. Um, Helen, uh, you're next. Um, hello, hi. Um, I'll share my screen, just a sec. Okay. Hi there, I'm Helen. I'm an um, infectious diseases physician based in the private sector. And thank you, Glenda, and your team for inviting me. And um, I'm going to show you what life is like in a private hospital that is trying to uh, manage this uh, outbreak at a very early stage. Um, so, and I'm going to stick to the outline that was uh, given to me. Um, then asked to comment on some successful success stories, uh, what we're doing and how we're managing our patients, the challenges that we are facing and the barriers that need to be overcome and what advice can we offer to other hospitals and doctors in other parts of our country. Um, uh, Vincent Bloody Hospital is a 310 bed facility um, that provided, provides a very broad range of care and it has specialized units as well. A dialysis unit, for instance, 70 uh, dialysis machines, a big rehabilitation facility, a big oncology uh, wards and uh, care, outpatient care, and a big mental health facility as well. And we provide a broad tertiary type service, a part uh, covering everything except for heme uh, oncology and transplantation medicine. And um, thus far, we've uh, managed roughly 250 COVID inpatients. And unfortunately, I cannot give you accurate data. Not only have we been um, faced with this pandemic uh, viral infect, well, 
viral infection, but we've also been hacked. Uh, the Life Healthcare Group has been hacked and um, we've been offline for the past month and it's been extremely stressful for everyone involved. Um, now the private sector is a different beast. It's, it's not the same as in the state sector where you have consultants and certain hierarchical structures that already exist. We're herding cats and it's very difficult to get everybody on the same page and singing from the same hymn sheet. And that's probably been the biggest challenge. We, however, have been very lucky in that our hospital management has been listening to the infectious diseases docs um, as well as the physicians. And, and we have a great community of doctors and um, we've come up very early on with an organogram and we organized ourselves. We have uh, the hospital management and everybody is paired with nurses as well as with uh, the doctors. So infectious diseases is paired with infection prevention control and we, we provide uh, broad uh, input and training and support all the different uh, units that are key in this outbreak response. And that is emergency room medicine, uh, critical care, the COVID wards, and of course, pediatrics, but pediatrics, uh, it's obviously not really affected, but everybody is on board and we have regular meetings. And then we have a very um, important uh, palliative care section that feeds into all the different sections. And that's, I'm going to show to you, is, 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 has become vitally important in our outbreak response. And of course, it's a private healthcare facility and you've got all these uh, 70 odd patients on dialysis, patients getting chemotherapy, and um, patient demands are high and of course we were sitting with a large inpatient burden that cannot be discharged and of course surgeons are needing to earn an income and if they don't work no one earns a salary and the um, no one gets paid and and that is all the uh, technical staff associated with all of this so this is all problematic and required leadership and then we have a lot of older doctors that um, we have stopped working, but they've been instrumental in providing um, uh, ethic support in, in difficult cases, uh, particularly when it comes to ventilation. So the, the key message is, um, as Mark highlighted in his talk, is to get uh, teams and get organized. Um, and we've held regular outbreak meetings with our team. And then we disseminate information via WhatsApp groups. And yes, there are issues with that and uh, com patient confidentiality, etc. But it's a rapid way of communicating. And it has shown if you cannot write emails anymore, uh, WhatsApp has become our medium, me medium of communication. And we've um, very early on intensified our RPC training and we trained our geriatricians, nephrologists, gynecologists, everybody. Uh, um, helped and um, we've been doing daily infectious diseases rounds just to get everybody on the same page and to standardize the treatment and the treatment protocols. Um, unfortunately the private sector it can be quite haphazard and it's very important to get everybody to do the same thing. Um, and we've also trained via Zoom twice a week and later on we continue with weekly uh, training sessions and we also have enormous buy-in from the general practitioners in the community that feed patients to us and many of them have kept patients out of hospitals and kept them in the long-term care facilities or all their terms and not necessarily transferred them in and, and lessened the burden on, on, on our inpatient service. So for, for us um, it was absolutely key uh, to rapidly identify um, our COVID patients um, because then you can uh, determine their clinical pathway and where they're going to be housed in the hospital. Uh, we only have a small number of isolation cubicles so we cannot have a PUI particularly if they require high, uh, high care or ICU care. Uh, we cannot you know, continue ventilating them in a ward space. We were lucky in that uh, we had uh, laboratory services that innovated with new technologies and could reduce our turnaround time to six hours. Um, and that has helped enormously. And then, of course, we were getting better with identifying these patients. Um, so now 
hopefully we'll get buy-in from the critical care team that a patient with primary respiratory failure, suggestive laboratory and radiological findings will immediately be escalated to ICU um, if it fits the clinical picture. Um, because the PCR can be negative and um, we were uh, relying then on uh, suggestive radiology when we suspected it. So this is a, a very important point in a smaller hospital to, to pay attention to your POI uh, settings. Um, also with severity assessments, we've become pretty good at assessing the appropriate level of care and that assessment gets made in emergency center. Um, and also very early on, whether this is a candidate for ventilation or not, and whether we should just palliate um, and advance directives, etc. So important, and that's where the private uh, practitioners have become so important in, in, in um, supporting us and also uh, helping us on the floor. And we've become pretty good at determining where the phase of their illness is and timing is absolutely key to know if they're day three of illness or day eight, nine, and whether or not they're still, uh, where the illness trajectory is, whether they're still going to get worse or better, or the, you know, that kind of helps in planning where, where they need to be managed in a high key with high flow nasal oxygen, or do they require ventilation future? So you can start to getting a, one gets a clinical feel for this and, and we've become better at it. Um, we've designed specialized stationery to simplify the thought processes. Um, most, a lot of our doctors are not um, um, they're phys physicians, but they've done other parts of medicine, rheumatologists, geriatricians, so they needed to step into the acute side of medicine. So this required learning and we designed stationery to make it easier to facilitate the thought process and the clinical management is very much protocol driven which is unusual for private sector medicine. Um, we also also try and practice antibiotic stewardship in this outbreak and limit the use of antibiotic therapy and also decided to just stick to Keftriaxone as opposed to uh, Comoxiclav because everybody in our peripheral area is allergic to penicillin, i.e. Uh, augmented. So Keftriaxone we used just as an initial antibiotic if it was necessary, but uh, that was usually stopped immediately. We used dexamethasone. Um, it's cheap, it's available. Um, that's we introduced since the 16th of June. We all uh, prophylax our patients. We use high doses in obese patients. And this is the clinical management, of course, in the wards. And uh, we've simplified our management protocols for hyperglycemia and for conscious proning. Um, don't forget to use your uh, respiratory physiotherapists. They are an enormous resource. Um, and this is something unique that we designed. And I, I think that's a very important uh, tool that can be adapted and used elsewhere. Uh, we've got that's the palliative care team that came up with this it's our communication team so they, they, they've designed an app um, where we enter the patient data that's on the left and we'll let them know whether the patient is stable on oxygen getting worse getting better etc and then the social worker team or palliative care doctor phones um, the the family members or next of kin and then the um, family gets informed and it takes time gives us, frees us up to do other activities and also it allows in some instances video conferences where we have um, the information technology on site and, and we have social workers then doing phone calls and conferences with their dying relatives. So the challenges in our setting uh, were as follow, fear, um, hospital transmissions, healthcare work infections and miscommunication. In the beginning everybody wanted a spacesuit. But I think with time and acknowledging the fear um, and also reassuring our colleagues um, that you know we have excellent protocols designed by experts in their field, we have uh, moved from the left uh, to down to the right um, and do pretty much uh, with our PPE what we're doing in the state sector and there are no spacesuits in our facility. So we, we've follow best practice in that regard and, and we've been successful ex so far. Unfortunately, we're seeing COVID transmissions in the non-COVID wards, for instance, long stay patients with coming in for pacemaker pocket infections requiring in-hospitalization um, for this and then unfortunately 
get um, infected by asymptomatic uh, healthcare workers, in this instance, a physiotherapist infected this patient and the patient subsequently died alone and it was very traumatic for, for everyone and family members. So the key message there is recognize that early in your uh, patients that are hospitalized for non-COVID illnesses, um, investigate this as an outbreak and contain the spread immediately. And, um, and just to, to let you know that we have a big dialysis unit, we have a rehabilitation facility. These patients can't go anywhere. They need ongoing care, they need the oncology, they need their biologics for their rheumatological um, disorders. And we need to continue providing a service which we are trying at, a, at, at present. And then miscommunication is another issue. A well-meaning nurse manager was trying to warn co-workers that uh, staff rooms pose a transmission risk and this resulted in a publication uh, or an article in some newspaper this is not even our hospital um, and there's a sense of blame but it isn't really but it's just the way we need to communicate and we need to acknowledge each other's vulnerabilities and fears and and hold them in our confidence and and, and not try and uh, shame anyone and, and unfortunately, sometimes in the most well-meaning way can result in this. And this is something we need to guard against. And then, of course, staff shortages. Um, High-risk expo exposures occurred initially. They don't occur any longer. We've had lots of staff that has been sick with COVID. Uh, I also have COVID at the moment. I can't smell a thing, but I'm getting better. But I'm not feeling so fresh. Um, but a lot of us get sick and then we come back on board and fortified hopefully. Luckily we've had uh, no deaths so far, but we've had um, nurses admitted to the critical care um, uh, side and luckily have done well. So barriers that need to be overcome. I think in any outbreak, space, staff and stuff is important. So I think uh, the learning opportunity is create enough POI wards create critical high key areas where you can deliver high flow nasal oxygen, create safe spaces to relax and breathe, use your gardens, send people outside, put tables and it's winter, but we need to go outside. We need to still talk to each other. We can do this outside and breathe and take our mask off outside. Upskill existing nurses. We are busy training our ward nurses to become more respiratory, uh, experience with uh, delivering high flow nasal oxygen, uh, utilize your physiotherapist, social workers as we're doing now and stuff, try and keep it simple, protocolize your medications, your insulin infusions, your PPE and ventilators just as an aside are useless without nurses or oxygen. So as a concluding remark, just uh, meet and communicate regularly. Um, simplify things, train, be flexible, adapt, and most importantly, be kind and acknowledge our shared human vulnerability. And don't forget to innovate. This is a lovely nurse, Sister Virginia, who innovates and um, um, it just makes it more bearable to, to wear these uh, masks that tend to hurt behind our ears after a while. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge all my co-workers, everybody at the hospital who's been absolutely phenomenal in, in helping and um, sharing this uh, burden and teams, as Mark said again, are absolutely key in getting through this. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. Um, I think we're now going to go have Kuni and, and Asha are on next. Um, you guys are on mute still, so please don't speak because we can't hear you. Okay, okay sorry. we're just going to share the screen. Oh, there we are. Thanks. Okay. This okay. So, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Glenda and Linda, for inviting us. Um, uh, Kuni and I work in the at Tigerberg Hospital and we are currently managing, managing the COVID 19 um, ICU. Um, can you all see my screen? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. Um, I told you to see. Okay, just give me a second. 
There you go. Okay, there you go. Excellent. And just put it down to the slideshow uh, from the beginning. Okay. So for those who don't know, this is Tigerberg um, Hospital. And this is actually a photo that was taken about a month ago. And I think it's one of the most beautiful photos of Tigerberg that I've seen in a very long time. Um, a bit of background of um, the hospital. Uh, Tigerberg is one of the uh, tertiary hospitals here in Cape Town. Um, it serves about 2 million people. And um, initially was a designated port of call for, for COVID-19. And as a result, we started preparing quite early on in the year. So um, December, January, when we started our initial preparations. Um, it has, it is the referral center for one of the largest hotspots in the Western Cape, which is the Kailicha district. As a result, I think we got many of the patients quite soon. Um, and uh, the numbers were quite um, were quite big very quickly. Um, so we just I'm gonna Kuni and I are gonna talk about the ICU specifically, and Shad will talk about I think hopefully the hospital response. Um, we admitted our first patient on the 26th of March, which seems a lifetime ago. I'll be honest. Um, and up till today, or last night, we admitted um, a total of 221 patients to the ICU. We managed to discharge 78 of them safely, and quite a few of them are discharged home. Um, and our mortality on overall is quite high, I mean 60%. Um, this included both, unlike Ruetzke, um, as Greg has alluded to, it, it included both intubated and um, patients on high flow um, nasal oxygen. It also included a lot of um, DOAs or uh, dead on arrival patients and patients that died within an hour of admission, so pretty soon. And some of them came within 10 minutes had, um, had, had demise. This is our, uh, the COVID ICU at the moment. Um, so A5 is a predominantly medical ICU pre-COVID and it's part of our general um, ICU or critical care services at Tigerberg Hospital. We, we pre-COVID again, we ran a, a unit of seven intubated patients. Adjacent to us, there were eight high care beds, which was run by general medicine. Um, from a personnel point of view, from a doctor uh, point of view, there was one intensivist and five pulmonologists. Our motto all these years was faith, hope and love and I see some of our sisters are, are have t-shirts with it at the moment and I'll, I'll be honest over the last couple of months that's never been um, that relevant to us, um, you know, because of the sheer challenges, frustrations, the, the ups and downs and, you know, the emotional roller coaster that we've been on since February. So I want to talk a little bit of, about how, just sort of an overview about how we escalated or what we escalated to and a couple of the challenges um, that we have faced over the uh, past couple of months in hope that, you know, you can take home ways of preparing your ICU or critical care services wherever you are. Um, and learn from some of the, of the frustrations that we had, the challenges that we had, which many of them were unexpected and came on um, daily. I think one of the big things that, that, that was highlighted for me is that no matter how much we planned and planned and planned, it never really prepared us for the actual onslaught of patients and all the daily um, once again, challenges that we had to face and we're still facing. So initially when we planned and, and this has panned out, um, we, our strategy was to divide our critical care services into two, two groups, that of just dealing with the COVID-19 patients of which A5 ICU um, was a designated unit. We've also managed to open a um, COVID high care bed, which is additional 10 beds which in a previously ward that was not capable of any um, critical care um, provision. 
And then the rest of the patients, the non-COVID-19 patients, or what we call incidental COVID, so those patients that were admitted for other diseases or other pathologies but happened to be um, to be tested positive because we are at the moment screening everybody that is hospitalized. They sort of are spread across the hospital, mainly in our um, general surgical ICU, um, the specialist units, theaters, PACUs, and we've even opened up a new totally equipped um, dedicated um, unit or ward just for the PUIs um, um, coming through trauma and surgery. So getting the beds or getting the space for the beds was probably the easiest um, for us, but getting the equipment was was a challenge. And I must admit, it you know, it was quite convenient that the ward next to A5 ICU was an entirely um, empty ward that was actually identified to um, decant other wards during renovations. And what we did was entirely clean that place and encrypted it to form a fully functional ICU from scratch. Um, and this included beds, monitors, resource trolleys, IVAX, um, beds, all of these uh, equipment that you're seeing on my slide at the moment. One of the, the biggest issues for me and still is uh, we managed, we had to identify areas um, where we could place showers at the entrance of um, the unit because um, and that took lots of um, involvement with, from our infrastructure guys and we at the end renovated both our kitchens to provide um, ab ablution facilities and, and showers which is very important for our ICU um, staff. Preparing for it also meant preparing the, the medical side. So we anticipated that many of the additional staff that we would require um, would come from the rest of the hospital, as Helen was saying, from doctors or registrars that have no idea um, how to manage sick ICU patients. Um, we are getting pay uh, registrars from nuclear medicine, radiology, surgery, anesthetists um, in their first year, some that just started a month ago. And what we did was we, we started a training program quite early in the, in the start of the preparation, going through the incubation processes, basics of mechanical ventilation and, um, and just basic ICU support and what we found this this constant training and supervising and guidance of all these registrars is necessary on a daily basis and you see on the photo at the bottom this is this was taken about maybe a month ago it's about or not so socially distance but we have our masks and our gowns but um, and literally talk, just speaking about basic ICU care about fluids sedation all that comes with just general good ICU supportive care. So one of the landmark um, kind of events was the high flow nasal oxygen um, that Greg has spoken about. Um, we, our first six patients were all intubated. It was quite early on in, in our, um, you know, in, the, in South Africa's involvement in the pandemic. Um, the first six were intubated and unfortunately all six um, demised about a month later. And at that stage, more literature was coming out about high flow nasal oxygen. And after chatting to some of, uh, some of the intensivists at, in, um, in, in FITS, we decided to attempt it in one of our patients. And the, patient, and the first picture that you see here was our first patient. And she came in with a PO2 of 5.5 and a PF ratio of less than 100. She was awake and alert. Um, we put her on high flow and that, uh, that photo was taken about three days post-admission, um, uh, post ICU admission. The good thing about high flow um, is that they're comfortable, they're able to communicate, they speak, uh, they tell you what they want. Um, and many of and if you look at the picture at the bottom, it's actually a patient that is currently in our unit at the moment. A lot of them are on their cell phones, able to do a lot of their own ADLs, 
and you know the entire ICU experience is a little bit better um, for them. So up to the 19th of June, we admitted about 107 patients with um, on high flow nasal oxygen. They were quite sick, as um, Greg has mentioned. Their mean PF ratio was about 82. Of those numbers, we managed to discharge 66 successfully, so about 62% success rate. I think it's also, and I think Greg also highlighted it, that it's not the, the answer to COVID pneumonia. You have to choose your patient, and it, 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 is, it, it is certainly can be considered as an alternative, but there are those patients that are going to need intubation from the outset, and there are those patients that are going to um, fail high flow um, and, and require intubation. Although high flow was quite promising, it brought about its own challenges. Um, we had to make sure that the hospital, the feasibility of providing high flow to such large number of patients was uh, well, well was feasible. We, at that stage, there was a travel restrictions, travel bans. There was problems about getting equipment into the country. And in fact, when when the travel restrictions were lifted slightly. Um, a lot of the international suppliers didn't even have material to make, in fact, to make some of the components. In fact, we are still waiting for a couple of humidifiers that I was ordered about two months ago. And then because high flow was generally not a very commonly used um, mode of ventilation, um, outside the ICU, we had to retrain or, or train the registrar's doctors again, and we're constantly doing that every day. So it's an ongoing um, education. The other thing that we did not expect with the high flow was, or was the fact that these patients, well, we expected it, but we didn't plan for it, uh, was that these patients are so awake and so alert and totally conscious about what is going on around them. And this was, this is a big problem in an ICU where patients are actually very sick and also an ICU with limited beds. And very often we find a mixture of both males and females or those that are intubated and or on high flow. And, it, and you know, it can be very traumatizing from a mental, point, mental health point of view for a lot of these patients because they actually see the deterioration of, the, of other patients in front of them and the deaths. And uh, many of them have actually told us that, you know, they'd rather leave the ICU. But unfortunately, because of the, the, the limited beds that we have, um, you know, this, is, this becomes log logistically impossible. So what we did, we managed to get some screens and try and provide them some sort of dignity, some sort of privacy, and some sort of, um, you know, uh, to try and alleviate some of the strain. The other big challenge to us was the lack of visitors um, to the hospital. Um, and many of these patients will, you know, I mean, the outcome is so unpredictable um, and they want to speak to their families and the families want to speak to them. And so we, we're using iPads, um, our robot, I don't know if many of you may have heard about Quentin, where we, we get the families on the phone or on the iPad and they're able to communicate with the families sometimes on a daily basis. Obviously the risk of aerosolization was a concern. As Greg says, you know, I don't think it was, and I agree, I don't, I don't think it's a big issue, but we have put in extractor fans throughout. We were initially going to change the entire ventilation system, but because of the numbers started increasing quite um, rapidly, the logistics of that was impossible. Um, and then we had, we upped our PPE um, during this phase. So if you look at the first photo, I think that was when there was our first two or three photos, uh, three, two or three patients coming and they were all intubated. And that was the first, our first attempt at PPE. And then once we started doing high flow, you can see it's changed quite dramatically with full PPE in, in, in the units. PPE has been, and IPC has been a massive issue, a massive challenge for us. Just and we, I think we underestimated just how much PPE is necessary to run such a busy unit. 
we currently, besides the, the large number of medical staff, the nursing staff, we have numerous simple visiting staff from the rest of the hospital, like the radiologists, the um, other disciplines, and they all use PPE. Um, and because of the rapid turnover of both registrars and nurses and doctors, IPC training um, becomes so important. And um, on the Fauchia is our um, sister, Aukam, and she's one of our IPC um, sisters. And she comes in daily or daily or as often as they want, and the IPC comes to keep on training. And I cannot emphasize that enough. They can't continuing training about IPC to reduce the risk of infection. You know, masks have been a problem um, just recently. I think Western Cape, the VFlex masks are not available. Um, and I think there's a shortage of the duck build in 95s um, currently. We, we are also given these N95s or what was purported to be N95s as a donation. And I put up the slide just as a reminder to be careful about donations and whatever donations of PPE are supplied to the hospital, very strict control and um, assessment by the IPC team is absolutely imperative because these masks that were given to us, you can see they actually have holes in it and were sold to or given to us to be used as in 95 masks into the in the in the COVID wards. But you know, in 95 shortage um, is is definitely an issue, and the hospital or the rest of the hospital has gone now to extended use. In I, I, in the ICU at the moment, Tigerberg Hospital has has got the services of a company called the BDC Africa. And, and what, it, what, what this company does is responsible for decontamination of these masks. So um, what ICU uh, A5 is doing at the moment is, um, is one of the wards where uh, the, the mask can be decontaminated and recycled. Um, and obviously this has gone through quite a rigorous um, process to assess its uh, feasibility. Then there's obviously the staffing challenges that everybody alluded to. Um, COVID-related sick leave made a massive impact in our uh, staff, which was already limited. Um, we relied, from a nursing point of view, we relied a lot on, on agency nurses. However, the, the appearance during shifts were erratic, um, and sometimes some would pitch up and within an hour to leave. Um, and I think a lot of this was related to fear and anxiety, which is a big issue in, in ICU, um, or I guess in any hospital um, that was, that's related to working in a COVID ICU. The other thing is a lot of these sisters and the medical staff, they do not have ICU experience and the fear and the apprehension of working with such sick patients has made a massive impact um, mentally as well as physically. But the most frustrating thing for us, for both Kuni and I, is you know the lack of nursing staff and our capacity, uh, and how it has been limited by it. And if you look at the first picture, is is basically a board that um, has the number of beds available for um, for the unit. Um, obviously, the names written are those patients that are on, and the board next to it is how many patients waiting for. Um, for ICU admission. Um, unfortunately, our sisters have been working at some stage one to three patient nurse to patient ratio, sometimes even one to five and one to six. And many of, our, of the referrals that we had um, did not get into ICU um, for this. But this has certainly improved over the past month or two. There have been lots of, um, you know, kind of ways that we've worked around it. There's lots of incentives put in, lots of con contracts being given, upskilling of nurses, um, and, and it has definitely improved. And, you know, the staffing challenges are not only about nursing staff and medical staff, but as Helen said, throughout the board. So, you know, cleaning is such an important part of IPC. Um, 
but uh, but about a month ago, I think we had one cleaner um, present in the ICU for about two weeks. As a result, the rest of the team, and I think this is important. You know, this whole this whole period is about teamwork, um, and they got together and we clean every couple of hours or whatever, whenever they had a free time, but go in and clean the ICU. And the first picture shows the sisters are cleaning at I think around one o'clock in the morning and these are our techs on the other side um, cleaning during the afternoon. The kitchen staff, the kitchen was closed at Tigerberg for a day or two uh, because of various issues and these two photos, um, just I, I just wanted to put it there because I, I thought it was amazing. Within about an hour we managed to get um, our registrars, our doctor, medical, our medical doctors got in food um, and people to donate food literally within an hour to feed our patients. And then super important is the medical and psychological support. And I know everybody has talked about it, but you know, ICU is such a difficult place. It's got the highest, it's a very high rate of burnout in a normal pre-COVID time. During COVID, it seems to have intensified by a thousand. Um, and I, I, I actually took this photo of the four registrars coming off the night shift and I don't think the photo does justice at just how exhausted they were, just not physically but also mentally. They had a very rough night with about six or seven deaths. Um, the registrar in the pink scrubs was in tears um, but still managed to smile for me um, and I think it's very important that you know that each ICU that's that's managing these patients have dedicated mental and psychological support for all staff, cleaners, doctors, nurses, right through, um, because you know it's it's the past three three or four months it's challenging and it's 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 not a fun time. Um, then there's all, you know, there's a couple of other challenges that we had, which I guess because of time, I'm not going to go through it, but PUIs have been a major issue for us. They are, you know, many of them need to go into isolation rooms if possible. And, you know, not many hospitals have isolation rooms. Um, initially, there was an issue about turning around time for results. Um, recently, over the past month, we have changed strategy in the hospital, so the turnaround time is actually much shorter and we can get results for our POIs and then um, uh, send them to either non-COVID or COVID area. And from a clinical point of view, you know, these patients are very sick and transfer of the patients, of these sick patients from other hospitals or even into the ward or between wards is extremely hazardous. Um, and it's something that you guys need to think about if you want to transfer to another place. And how we've, how our our region or or how we managed it is that our referring hospitals have increased their capacity in terms of equipment and nursing staff and 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 all the components in order to manage their own patients um, to limit um, transfer and use use their resources effectively. And just on a large last slide, you know, I think one of the, the outline or one of the questions or one of the points I was asked to, um, to talk about is the positives and the negatives and advice. And I thought about that. And the one thing that stands out for me over the past three months, despite all the frustrations, the red tape, the politics, the bad press, the fights, what stands out to me is the fact that everybody works together. And I think, I think it's an ongoing theme throughout all the talkers that we can only get through this if we work together. And there's a sense of camaraderie that is unbelievable. A sense of being a team that we will, you know, this too shall pass. Um, and not just in the ICU, and not just in Tiger Book Hospital, but across all the all platform. So the communication between um, different hospitals, between different units, different disciplines, different doctors, you know, 
uh, speaking to each other, supporting each other, and, and helping where you can is the only way um, that we have got to do this. Um, and that's my advice to everybody. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. Um, that was um, really moving. Um, Kun, um, I don't know, Kuni, are you there? I don't know if, you can, if there's anything you can say after Usha. Uh, no, it's difficult to follow after Usha. Um, I, I think I the one thing that, that I can may just say is that one other thing that I can perhaps share is, is we, we've started using the term clinical COVID. So I think, um, so with the PUIs, if they really have, this disease is so unique. Um, it, it's, there is, I mean, Ivan and Rui will tell you more, but there, I'm not aware of any disease where you have all these features like a high CRP, the classical infiltrates, the, the, the history, the, the, the combination of everything. And that although uh, Usha stressed the fact about the PUIs being a frustration, we actually have gone to the point where we cohort the clinic, where well, we call clinically COVID patients with the other patients. That's that just one piece of advice. Um, and I, th I don't think I have much to add. At the end, I'll, I'll just summarize if there's anything more. But I think the, 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 the frustrating bit in the beginning of your response would be the PUIs. And then obviously the staffing issue and um, and if I can uh, look, I can perhaps just reflect. We had a meeting in March, I think, with the uh, what's it, NSID, yeah. and at the time we were asked about what's going to be the challenge, ventilators, how many beds do you need? Now, if I can give you just one bit of advice, two bits of advice. What PPE and staff are the two major challenges that ventilators are not really what, what you're going to need. So you're going to have to, to look after your staff. You'll, you, you expect to have at some point up to 40% of your nursing staff off sick. Um, so that's a major, major challenge. And then um, PPE is a, and if you think you've got enough, you're wrong. Uh, you, you can never um, have enough PPE. I think that's about anything yeah, else. Yeah, can okay. never have enough PPE. We're all listening. Um, one of our <laughs> fears about that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna end off with Ivan and and um, uh, Ivan and and Nishad is gonna are gonna end off the the panel, and then I'm gonna ask Lydia to to take take over the um, the um, the discussions and and then Kuni will, will will end. Um, Ivan, are you still on? You haven't left to go to ICU. No, I'm still here. Um, right, you can hear me. Uh, so just to say af afternoon to all of you, um, and really a big thank you to Lydia and uh, Glenda to inviting me uh, for inviting me to participate in the meeting. Um, I haven't made slides. Um, I thought we were going to have more of a round table Q and A type uh, uh, meeting, but I will go through the things that I've, I've jotted down. Um, I think in terms of the things we were asked to, to, to share with you is first of all, what we felt the successes were from a, a provincial point of view. And I think probably our, our biggest success is that we haven't had unfettered chaos um, in terms of the management of COVID. And while all of the system has been busy, um, and I think that goes for everywhere from the EUs through uh, emergency, uh, the, the EMS services, all the way through to ICU, it has been busy, but we haven't had uh, scenes like we've seen on, on the news from New York and Italy with patients just lying everywhere, um, trying to ventilate patients in hallways, etc. So, so been busy but it hasn't been chaos why did we achieve that success well i think we've got a very strong uh, provincial critical care network we have a forum and we spent a lot of time planning what our response would be and then as the pandemic started to take off we in fact invited all of our eu uh, uh, eus around the province to send representatives to our meetings and it meant that from a provincial perspective, every single EU in the province knew what our strategy was. 
um, for managing patients all the way through to ICU. Um, what our triage criteria would be, what our triage process would be, uh, etc. And I think that helped everyone on the ground out there to know exactly what it is that we'd be doing and how we would be thinking about things and it made sure that everyone was playing on the same page. So I think, I think that was particularly important. And then from a hospital perspective in terms of, of planning, um, is just to say to all of you who are trying to grapple with these questions, think about what the maximum number of patients you feel you could probably reasonably deal with is and add about a half onto that and you'll get some idea of what you need to do. Um, our Department of Critical Care, ordinarily we run just over 30 beds, um, between 30 and 35 ICU beds. At the moment, we're running 45 ventilated COVID beds plus the rest of our service. So our, ex our, our expansion has been enormous um, and that's put a lot of pressure on staff. But again, we've avoided the chaos. Then I think our second biggest uh, success, and it, it, it follows on from what Usha and Kuni have been talking about, um, we've just got, we've gone to just over 4,000 ventilated COVID days in ICU now, that's our, our patient bed days, and we haven't had a single member of staff in ICU, and I speak now for the medical staff and the nursing staff, contract COVID during that period of time. And from the hospital. We have one nurse who's contracted COVID. She's off work at the moment and her husband has been sick um, for about, uh, was sick for about a week with COVID before she got sick. And by her own admission, she doesn't feel um, she's an occupational exposure. So I think our, our PPE works and I think there's no doubt in the hospital that the safest people from a COVID perspective have been people who are working in ICU. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, there was tremendous fear about working in COVID areas and a lot of people wanting to opt out of working in COVID areas. And it's just to say that within the hospital, there have been numerous outbreaks of COVID in different departments, but from an ICU perspective, we've been the safest group of people. And if you, if you wonder why that is, I think it's because we know when we're working in an at-risk environment, um, we take the precautions we need to, and um, we're meticulous in, in the practice of our PPE. And then just to say, we're using very modest PPE. We're not hazmat suits and, and, and crazy things, really a very, very modest approach, um, but trying to be meticulous about it. And I think it's working nicely. As far as the failures go um, for the moment, I think, I think the biggest failure I feel is we had plans to engage the private sector to look after uh, state patients. And to date, we've tried to refer three patients to, or we've only referred three patients to private. I think the reality is the private sector is very, very full with patients in their own right. And there also seems to have been an unwillingness um, amongst a number of private practitioners to, to manage state patients. And I, I think then from a, a planning point of view, for the rest of you who are wondering, you know, what are we going to do um, from a state uh, medical perspective, I don't think private offers any, any big resource or any big salvation. And I don't think you should... You should count on that as your strategy for managing um, COVID. As far as the challenges go, then I think Kuni highlighted this. I think that there are two major challenges. The first one is without a doubt uh, nursing staff. Um, and as Kuni um, quite correctly pointed out, your initial planning may want to turn to monitors and beds and ventilators and pieces of equipment. At the end of the day, it's going to be your ability to, to, to have staff at work that is going to hamper you most um, in terms of the, your ability to manage the, the patient load that you face and the service you need to run. And then I think our next biggest challenge, and I disagree a little, is not so much availability of PPE, it's availability of other stock. 
And at the moment, um, from within Khrudeskir, and I'm aware of issues in the private sector, we're actually slowly running out of access to many, many things that are not PPE. So, so filters for ventilators are becoming hard to source. Closed circuit suctions are now becoming hard to source. Um, and, and the reality is the supply chain to South Africa for products that we're uh, relying on coming from from outside of South Africa, probably more particularly Europe than other places, has slowed down substantially and companies are inundated with uh, orders from around the world. And I think what we're experiencing with our PPE now is going to roll out into a lot of other, um, other areas, including consumables and also quite possibly uh, a number of pharmaceuticals. And so in terms of your planning, wherever you are, I think you can't plan to have too much of anything. Um, uh, just make sure you do the best you can from a procurement perspective, because that's going to become a, a, a limitation. Um, then also in terms of challenges, and again, this has been mentioned, I think the transfer of patients is a major challenge. And we realized very, very quickly that a strategy of having Tigerberg Hospital and Kurdiskir Hospital ICUs manage all the patients um, was going to go nowhere. Every hospital needs to have the ability and the facility to ventilate intubated patients prior to transfer. And my own experience of intubating and trying to manage or, or managing intubated COVIDs is that uh, a number of patients get intubated and they deteriorate steadily. They never stable enough to, to transfer and they demise. But a, a big number of patients given four to six hours of good ventilation can actually wean quite substantially on an FO to get down to around 60% and be transferred safely. And transferring freshly intubated, hypoxic and unstable COVID patients kills them. So I think, I think there's a big challenge out there in terms of managing that. And if your hospital's strategy or your, your EU strategy is, oh, we'll just tube the patient and transfer them to wherever, um, I don't think it's going to work out for you. So I think that's a, a big challenge. As far as barriers go in, in terms of your planning to, to deal with COVID, I would just say I think you're all quite familiar with the fact that we meet people who are facilitators and we meet people who are blockers and is please don't waste your time dealing with blockers time will be short and your patience will wear thin um, try and identify those people who are prepared and willing to help um, and capitalize on relationships with them uh, the, the the no can do people are not going to help you one bit in dealing with the, in dealing with the pandemic and then in terms of other bits of advice that I thought I can, I can give you is, again, I mentioned it, and I think it was Kuni, this idea that we can have a COVID and a non-COVID service um, is nonsense. First of all, we've had a huge number of COVIDs pop up unexpectedly in the non-COVID service. And not surprisingly then we've had a huge number of staff and other patients contract COVID in the hospital predominantly in non-COVID areas and if you're a doctor who thinks that COVID won't touch your life or your practice because you you're not in you you feel you're involved um, in a in a sphere that's not close to 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 internal medicine or pulmonology or ICU you're wrong um, and I mean, we've got ophthalmologists working in our medical ward, wards, assisting with managing patients who are on high flow nasal oxygen. Um, the staff of Kruzky Hospital has been redeployed absolutely dramatically. Um, and the vast majority of the service the hospital delivers at the moment is, is a COVID service. So in our planning to roll wards out, the reality is COVID has rolled through the hospital so that there are more COVID areas by a long shot than um, non-COVID areas. And then I think Mark mentioned it right at the beginning, the importance of having teams. It would be one of the 
best pieces of advice I could give you is to make sure that you form good teams to manage the problem. And in terms of those teams, you don't just need clinicians and nurses and other healthcare workers. You need to make sure that your hospital and your provincial management are actively engaged in those teams and that they playing for the team. And then the last thing I wanted to say is just, just following a, a meeting we had today is it, it's probably very, very important to give your staff enough time to debrief and deal with uh, and have some time to talk about what it is they're going through in terms of this uh, crazy pandemic. Um, I think clearly they're, they're individuals in a system who are very, very resilient and, and COVID will wash over them um, and, and they would never really notice it. Um, equally, there are a number of our colleagues and people who are working in the system who I think this is touching their lives very profoundly and we need to be uh, sensitive to that. So in terms of what I think the successes, the failures, the challenges, the barriers and the advice is, there you go, you've got it from me. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Alan. It was really great, um, really great um, advice that you've given us. And Nishad, um, you're going to have the last, for better or worse, you're going to have the last word um, before Lydia takes over. Is he still here? Nishad, um, we can't see you and we can't hear you. Have we lost him? Have I lost? Maybe I'm the one that's lost. Can you hear me? Um, Glenda, we're just giving him a call. Uh, okay. Um, see. There might be some, um, so Lydia, uh, maybe there, there might be some, some um, instability of the line. So maybe while we wait for him to go on, we can start. Um, I think you've been there, uh, be, be keeping up with all the, um, uh, some of the questions. I don't know if you want us to hand over to you so while we wait for him you can just deal with some of the questions that are coming through and direct them. Hi, sure. Thanks, Linda. Can, can you see and hear me? Um, you there. So, so great. So, I mean, I've clustered some of the questions and I think um, there have been quite a few questions around just on the clinical management side of things and um, perhaps um, uh, Greg and Helen could, could comment on this. So, um, uh, Dexamethasone fluids, anticoagulation, what's the kind of um, clinical um, mix of things that are being used? What doses and what are some of the issues around, around those, particularly around anticoagulation at maximum um, doses of clexane? Is there anything else we can add? So if I can ask Greg to, to start with that. Um, I can't even start my video. It says the host has disabled it, but I don't think it's necessarily yeah, um, important. Um, so um, the question is, is there, are there any adjunctive therapies? Um, certainly in the very sick patients um, who are very breathless and not able to keep up with the uh, fluid intake, we have been given cautious intravenous fluids. And something that's come up in the chat as well has been um, the importance of, of glycemic control. Um, COVID seems to be something that drives um, presentations of uh, over diabetes. When we check HbA1cs, we often find that these patients are, you know, undiagnosed diabetics. So we've we've been quite aggressive with uh, insulin and uh, and glycemic control, usually with the basal bolus regimen, um, dexamethasone, as you said, um, and I think also important to monitor for non-COVID reasons for deterioration. So. Um, Optimizing anticoagulation. I think that's something that's also been discussed on the chat. Um, and importantly, uh, particularly because you're dealing with a group of patients who are quite uh, overweight. Um, well, it, in our experience, we've had about 40% of our patients being either uh, obese or morbidly obese. So to use proper weight-based dosing for low molecular weight heparin and, and if the facilities are available to monitor factor 10A levels. Although I must say, logistically, that, that's quite a problem for us. Um, you have to take blood at a certain time. The uh, blood isn't stable for very long. Um, for us, the assay gets done at another hospital. So it's not without its problems. 
And generally, we want to limit the amount of blood draws and uh, clinical encounters that we have with, uh, uh, with our patients um, that are potentially uh, exposures. Um, so, so just to come back to um, uh, reasons for clinical worsening, so just to think about fluid overload, to think about concomitant cardiac disease, um, to think about optimization of anticoagulation, because it's often very difficult to transport very sick patients to the scanner for a diagnostic test. Um, and then lastly, to consider the possibility of nosocomial infection, um, particularly in patients who have been transferred between hospitals and may have been on modalities like high flow for quite a long time. Thanks, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thanks, Nishad, back. Nishad, yeah. what happened? Where did you go? Uh, <laughs> apologies for that. As I clicked the start video, the application crashed. I could hear you guys, but you couldn't hear me or you couldn't see me. So apologies for that. I had to restart, go out and restart. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm Nishad Schroeder. I, I um, am uh, the general special head of Division of General Internal Medicine at Tigerberg and have responsibility for Metro East. Um, and along with Ivan, um, myself and, and Lee Wallace from Emergency Medicine, we've also kind of been made, uh, asked to be coordinating clinicians for different parts of the response with uh, Lee Wallace doing emergency medicine, myself doing acute inpatient response and I, Ivan um, coordinating the critical care response. So, so I've been playing several roles in terms of internally at Tigerberg Hospital as well as on the platform as um, uh, Ayanda had, uh, had indicated in, the, in his presentation, you know, supporting the smaller hospitals that drain to Tigerberg Hospital. Um, so I've had kind of a, a more of a bird's eye view as well in terms of um, linking in with provincial planning and the field hospital um, commissioning, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I think a lot has been said already and I'm just, I'm just going to echo a couple of things that have been said, um, you know, starting with, um, with what Mark said right at the beginning, you know, you, you, you cannot do this alone. People are key um, and I definitely share this view. Um, and the sooner you can galvanize people and you can, and, and as I've been looking at the comments on the chat and um and you can sense the teamwork and camaraderie and the collaboration uh, within the western cape um, um response to covid um, even though there's a lot of people saying we're stuffing it up <laughs> um but um but you know there's a couple of things you know that also ring true um this the issue of, you know staff you know we had this this notion of um, COVID and non-COVID areas. And, um, and, you know, with this idea to try and protect certain services. Um, and especially it sort of came to a head a little bit with surgical disciplines who are trying to obviously protect um, theater time and aesthetic resources. Um, and we're resisting sort of de-escalation. It's natural, people are, you know, averse to change or anything that's gonna take them out of their comfort zone. It's all part of the ride, as Ivan indicated. You know, it's you're going to get people resisting, but you know, sometimes people do come around, and you sometimes just have to give them time. You know, I, I really feel for the obstetricians. I mean, I think they, you know, they had they had already been feeling quite a bit of pressure in terms of you know um, um, obstetric acute obstetric services, and you know, COVID is come and also swept them off their feet and, and, and expected them to, to, to really um, to up their game. And, you know, obstetricians um, are really tired most of the time. <laughs> so I, I really feel for them. But, you know, we've had good collaboration, you know, internally and externally trying to support them as well, especially with the sick, pregnant COVID patients. But I think, you know, I also want to just second what Ivan said about, you know, people thinking that they are safe in non-COVID areas. And we've, we've realized this, you know, a while ago that that, that idea potentially, actually, potentially endangers people by thinking that they are safe in non-COVID areas. They tend to slack when it comes to their IPC rules and their PPE um, 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 and, and even their social distancing, you know. And it, we, we've had exactly the same experience at Tigerberg that Helen has indicated. 
you know, staff tea rooms. And, and, and one of the crucial things that we, tend, we, we overlooked and we suffered with at the start of lockdown was the disruption of staff transport, public transport for our staff, who then ended up cramming into any available taxi and cramming into each other's cars. And, and, and those were all perfect, you know, perfect storm for spreading of COVID. And in fact, most of our staff infections have come out of the non-COVID areas. In fact, our kitchen is the highest number of people infected. Um, so, and we, when we think it's all not related, I mean, they, I mean, the kitchen staff don't go into, into clinical areas. So, so I think the sooner we accept that and, and advice for the rest of the country is, you know, you can, people are going to try and resist and they're going to want to try and re, re, protect their services and their resources. But the reality is COVID is going to find everybody and we are, you know, we expect, we're experiencing exactly the same thing, you know, it, you know, co coincidental COVID in your non COVID areas in inverted commas is a real issue. And especially when you're going into the peak, patients are coming there for other reasons, but happened, you know, just coincidentally happened to be infected with COVID, you know, um, so, and, and don't have COVID pneumonia. So I think people need to be aware of that because that's, that's going to be a real risk. Um, a couple other points I wanted to make, you know, so people are asking about, oh, can you kind of predict the severity, um, you know, um, who's going to do badly, especially, you know, who are you going to transfer to to higher level of care? And certainly what's come out uh, in our experience, certainly within Cape Town um, and the disease spectrum is diabetes and obesity. And if we look at, and if we look at the two um, sub-districts in the metro with the highest death rates per 100,000 population that's that's like far and away Kailicha and Klippentain and and I, and I think if you look at the suburbs or the uh, the townships that are in those sub-districts uh, I think it's going to be quite evident um, that um, the social determinants of health and inequality have been exposed and laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic and so if you are going to talk about advocacy for patients going forward after this, I think we need to start talking about, you know, improving the lives of all the people in our country, because, you know, as you can see, in terms of everybody scrambling for, for what is going to help, what is going to cure them, what is going to save them. And, and, and for now, you know, this has been a very humbling disease. You know, experts are novices again. And, we're all learning as we go along. And, and, and sometimes you will feel like a passenger, not actually an active participant in this, you know, when it really gets, gets, gets to the pointy end of the, of the pandemic. Um, I just want to say a few words about, obviously, um, the, this coordinating clinician role. And, and there's been a lot of lessons there. Um, and, and I know it's going to vary from province to province, but I think provincial management engagement is key. And we've been fortunate, you know, the clinicians have been brought in to planning and advisory roles. And, and we've been, help, you know, we, as, Guy, as Ivan has indicated, you know, we've been asked to guide prioritization of resources, clinical protocols, algorithms, um, guidelines. Um, you know, we've been consulted when it comes to um, influencing strategy changes, you know, um, especially around testing strategy and what do we put our resources into. Um, we've been, you know, we've been asked to give feedback on a regular basis from the coalface. What is, what is happening? Putting the numbers that the public health guys are, are, are collecting, put them, putting those into context as to what are the realities, what are we seeing, help us understand that. That's really, really been great. Um, the health sector has also been supporting other sectors. You know, I've, I've been, I was brought in to go and assist correctional services going into the prisons, you know, looking at their systems, guiding them and how to manage their, their, their COVID um, cases, potential COVID cases, and ones that they are really sitting with in the prison sector. So, so that's all been facilitated through the provincial, you know, provincial management structures. You know, we've been involved with, you know, we, we, we've been stressing, obviously, the supply chain issues and, and making sure those are paid attention to. We've been involved in our PPE protection strategies, 
because yes, the reality is we're going to have to protect PPE. You know, at the start of our experience, PPE started disappearing. Um, boxes of stuff started leaving the hospital. And so you, you need to pay attention to those things that you don't have unnecessary wastage um, and that you have strategies in to protect your PPE. I think we've been involved in, you know, guiding the health technology. You know, at the start, everybody was focused on ventilators. We need to buy more, we need to buy more, hundreds and hundreds of ventilators. You know, we had to change direction, you know, uh, mid, you know, mid response to say actually high flows emerging as something better, um, potentially cheaper, um, you know, less resource intensive, but we had to go into our infrastructure and say, well, there's a potential to collapse our oxygen supply and you know, the oxygen delivery systems may not cope. And we've had to you know, go into all of those things, looking at the oxygen infrastructure of the different hospitals, who can cope with what. And, and it's, all of this has been on the go, on the fly, trying to manage the clinical services and help you know, guide planning and response. Um, you know, we've been brought into infrastructure modification and all sorts of things in hospitals and temporary structures and field hospitals and guiding how we're going to manage the care in those spaces and supporting that. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's been an interesting ride. Um, but I want to end off with one last sort of thing. And I, I'm, I didn't prepare any slides, but I want to share this. Um, and it speaks to leadership. And there was a very interesting article in JAMA Cardiology, which was shared to me from one of my colleagues, Arifa Parker. And it's this article, and if you can see that, um, I actually, wait, I'm not sharing yet. Let me just share that screen. Um, some of you may have seen it. Um, it's this one. And it's on the front lines. Uh, is it, can you guys see that? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. So, it's, so it's an opinion piece um, uh, by Mega Prasad on the front lines of coronavirus disease 2019. Uh, uh, the many faces of leadership, and this is a cardiologist's perspective who's gone in and helped in the COVID wards and the lessons that he's learned. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to kind of just end off with some points. Um, out of that article, uh, just a one slide PowerPoint. And I, think, and I think the leadership lessons for a lot of sort of uh, senior people that may be on this call is, you know, the first lesson is availability. So, you know, Mark Mendelssohn had to leave, he's had to go down to the EC, you know, there's patients to be seen. The fact that he's down there, that we all down there, senior people, that that sort of triggers positive responses in your teams and your frontline people. Being available, being with them in the trenches, I think makes a significant difference. I think communicating with them on a regular basis with what the new developments are, what the changes are, you know, addressing the concerns, so finding all the different mediums to communicate. You know, initially we started off with sort of meetings and it became apparent that we need to also keep ourselves separate from each other, as part of the physical distancing, you move to electronic platforms. And that's also been a steep learning curve, but it's all the modalities that we've been trying to share and you know, WhatsApp groups and, and, and pages to share resource, you know, uh, you know, uh, informal websites to create, you know, to pull resources and share that. I think a, a third thing from that article is adaptability. You know, uh, you know, we all like our routines, COVID is going to disrupt all routines, all normality in your system and your life. And that's obvious to some already, most of us in the Western Cape and probably a lot of you up in, in other parts of the country already. And so being adaptable and adapting to the different, the new normal and changing and, and, and getting comfortable with that is gonna be an important aspect of leadership. Because, you know, there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and people are going to need beacons to kind of gravitate towards, um, but, but also humility. You know, humility is an important thing in your leadership response. This is a new disease. We are all trying to, 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 to get a handle on it, trying to figure out what we do, how we do it, what's going to make a difference. Um, and, and by just showing that humility, even to your juniors, um, to, to, 
be not afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know if we're doing the right thing. I think puts them at ease as well to, to say that, you know, that, that there's, that it's okay to be uncertain. It's okay to not know. Um, I think it, it releases a lot of anxiety and tension. And the last point from that, from that piece is gratitude. I think to express gratitude, you know, to, 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 to say thank you, to, to encourage them, um, to, um, you know, um, you know, we've been, we've been, certainly we've been spoiled to Tigerberg, you know, uh, we've got, uh, you know, our dermatology registrar on regular occasion who's been joined the COVID team is regularly spoiling us with cookies and cupcakes and, and, and phoning a connections to have Willie's yogurts and milkshakes and all sorts of things to spoil the COVID team. You know, that gratitude, you know, that gets shown, um, it's going to, you know, it's going to take you back to the very first point that, that, that Mark make, you know, we cannot do this without people and, and, and people need to feel that they are appreciated and they are acknowledged. And so gratitude is an important thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that and allow questions. Thanks. Um, we did solicit uh, the team and whoever can stay will stay until 6.30. Um, we, we do realize that um, there was so much important um, things to hear from this team. And I just want to, again, um, just congratulate uh, the team and, and acknowledge the hard work they've done. And, and we, are, we are so grateful for all you've told us today. I'm going to hand over to Lydia now. And she will she will um, and manage the next part of the of the seminar. And thank you for staying. We will, we will go till six thirty. So if anyone, and um, so so we will continue and let Lydia do this next session. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks very much, Helen. So I've I've got a few clustered questions which I think I'll just direct. And any of the panelists want to come in on them, please do. Ivan unfortunately had to leave as well. Um, he sends his apologies. Um, there were a few questions around high flow nasal oxygen in smaller hospitals and community centers. And I don't know, perhaps Ayanda, if you could comment on that and maybe at the same time comment on the field hospital experience that, that you've had. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe anyone else can speak about the feasibility of high flow in district hospitals. Hi, Ledeo. Thank you very much. Look, um, yeah, we've uh, also considered um, the use of high flow nasal for oxygen. The limitations we have is, is, is infrastructure, as I said. Um, just you know, we, when we spoke to our engineers, we just don't seem to be able to have the sort of the pipes um, to be able to deliver um, sort of high flow nasal flow oxygen. It's only a few areas within the hospital um, that does. Um, the other issue we have with that is that, as you see, seen in Greg's talk, um, is that most patients on high flow um, will usually be on it for a minimum of a week. Um, so that becomes quite challenging um, when you've got an increasing number of admissions and you push for discharges. So we are still in sort of discussions with regards to our ICU colleagues um, and our emergency unit uh, team um, to see actually when exactly we can actually um, um, you know, start this therapy. Um, and what other limitations we had is that the only area that we sort of really can within around the hospital to sort of um, administer this, this therapy um, is in the emergency unit, um, which is not an ideal, ideal place for this, for this therapy as, you know, patients will be there for a week. But yeah, I mean, I think there is a role um, and I think, um, you know, it just needs a sort of consultation um, with, regard, with regards to that. Um, and then with regards to the field hospital, um, the field hospital has been amazing for us. Um, as you can see, we've already got close to 100 patients there since the beginning of, of, of June. Um, and uh, it really has helped us immensely uh, decant. Um, we are using it currently at the moment um, based on as a form of intermediate to sort of palliative care. Um, and it has, been, it has been fantastic for us. Thank you. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks, Ayanda. Um, I don't know, um, Usha or, or Kuni, if you want to comment on um, some of the issues around oxygen supply and needing to get engineers in to come and check and some of the experience around that and, and um, expanding the oxygen supply. Um, hi, yeah, so the main issue with high flow, obviously, um, you know, the, the flows, as, as Greg has said, um, is much higher than your normal oxygen, I mean, your normal cannulas and your masks in the wards. Um, and in order to deliver those flows, you need a certain kind of um, delivery system. Uh, many of the hospitals do not have that because 
the ventilator flows and the um, oxygen cannulas and, uh, and masks have uh, require much lower flows. In terms of the oxygen supply, because you're giving them at least, well, between 40 to 60 liters per minute, you need a hell of a lot of oxygen. Um, and if your hospital isn't able to, or have the pipes or the, the pipes, you, the, diameter. the diameter of the pipes um, to supply the flow that is required, you're unable to deliver um, high flow. So many of the regional hospitals and district hospitals, the smaller hospitals do not have that. We were lucky at Tigerberg Hospital, even though we're very old, um, that uh, after we assess that, um, that most of our pipes could and a lot of our wards could as well. But it's certainly not um, common throughout the rest of the hospitals. Um, oxygen supply, you need massive tanks. Um, just to give you um, an idea of how much oxygen is required, um, from one ward to the next, you can easily run out of a full oxygen tank um, if you're transporting somebody on high flow, which has happened in our, in our unit. Yeah. So it's got about half an hour um, use if you're, if you're running at about 50 to 60 liters per minute, um, which is also quite hazardous by when you're transporting. That's why a lot of the patients, if you, in the, in, if you want to transfer, your patients, you rather intubate rather than transfer them on high flow because of the oxygen demand that is required. Um, I must admit, I don't know the details, the logistics, and the you know the the technical part about um, the oxygen supply and all the pipes and all of that. But I, that's my basic understanding. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, just to, to comment as well, our, our engineers have been very involved at Critis Gear in, in terms of looking at that. And it's something that needs to happen quite early on when planning this. Um, there's been a question around maintaining non-COVID services and um, how we've looked at dividing staff. Um, and this is an open question to, to any of the clinicians on the panel. Um, we have about 50% of all departmental staff has been um, allocated to the COVID service at Critis Care. It would be interesting to hear at other hospitals what has been done and how the shift systems are working. Yeah, so, so I mean, I can, maybe I can start there. You know, we also went the kind of 50 down the middle, um, splitting the teams into two sides, um, and then obviously trying to monitor what um, the load is going to be on each. And, and, you know, I think you're going to go through different phases um, as your epidemic unfolds um, in your part of the world. And also depends on, 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 on the kind of referral patterns and, and how patients present to your services. So, so it's been quite different. Um, you know, we de-escalated quite, quite a bit early. We, we split staff, um, you know, with just from within medicine into two sides of the service. Um, and, you know, as we were waiting um, for patients to arrive, we had lots of well patients coming for testing um, and then mildly symptomatic patients coming for testing. And then it started trickling in terms of, in terms of actual COVID positive patients. But what we did certainly on, you know, on, on, at the Tiger again is that we, because, you know, we had engaged quite early with our deferral hospitals and assisted with them getting prepared, we pulled all the patients across to us. Um, so, you know, with the escalation um, and, and, and also just in terms of splitting the teams, we brought a lot of the sub-disciplines into general medicine, you know, um, and picked up a lot of the general medicine work while a lot of the general medicine resources had been directed towards the COVID response, you know, supplementing ID and helping out, you know, helping ID. Um, we were able to maintain, you know, the, the split. But as we kind of, what we're noticing now as we kind of go into um, the peak of the ep epidemic, we are noticing more inadvertent COVID popping up in that part of the system. And that then it becomes a challenge because we're now kind of at that point where we're going to, you know, probably get to what Kritisky has is, 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 is done is collapse everything into COVID. And you just deal, you know, the same teams deal with, you know, likely COVID, COVID pneumonias, 
and unlikely. And you try and keep those wards, you keep the wards separated, but the teams is going to be very difficult to keep separated going forward. Um, you know, so we've maintained obviously acute admission services and beds and wards for that. Um, we've secured high care that we lost from the general medicine side to COVID. We secured, you know, support from um, uh, the renal unit. Um, we had some high care capacity to look after general medicine, high care, cardiology, you know, we had an ICU high care to do some, some, some general medicine high care, you know, non-cardiology patients going into, into those spaces. So, you know, that's, that's the teamwork that we've had to obviously negotiate and the willingness, you know, for that, uh, for people to do that. And, and, um, but in, in reality, um, even, you know, what was envisaged to be non-COVID services are now having to deal with COVID in their spaces as well. So I think, I think that split of COVID and non-COVID kind of makes sense at the start, but then it becomes increasingly irrelevant and you just got to deal with whatever comes to the door. Um, uh, the next question I'd actually like to address to Helen. So there's been some sort of discussion on the chat and in the questions around differing protocols. Um, and also the, um, uh, Ivan mentioned the difficulty of getting patients over from public to private. And I wonder from your perspective on this, what, what's the, been the experience from, from your side? Um, thanks, uh, Lydia, for giving me the opportunity to, to, to comment on that. Um, I think... I had one slide and it showed a lot of cats and that, that represents the private sector. And it's really difficult to get everybody to, to pull in the same direction and, and uh, coordinate care. And I think, but one has to just remember, everybody in this forum, all doctors have worked in the state sector, but not everybody has worked in the private sector. And it's incredibly difficult to work in the private sector. There are huge demands on us um, and sometimes unfairly so. And also, well, a lot of doctors are um, working in the state sector. They have guaranteed salaries. We do not. Okay. Um, for instance, our billing system, our um, uh, life healthcare has been hacked. So, for instance, none of the patients' admissions have been properly registered. None of us have been billing for the last month. And it doesn't matter. And we don't bill. And myself and Kevin Reby have been doing, put in enormous hours for no extra income. So I think it needs to be understood by everybody on this forum that everybody is working hard and it's not just the state sector. We're all working and we're tired and we're burning out and we're getting sick and we all carry the same risks because where does your mother go to when she fractures her hip? Where does your sister or your child go to when they get sick? And where does your friend who's a healthcare worker get ventilated when they get COVID? And where do your nurses go to when they get COVID? They come to the private sector. So this division is artificial. And also with respect to the service level agreement, there was discussion. And most of us are happy to work for free and we're happy to give our hours and we have already done so. But our limitation is nursing staff. And I, appreciate what Ivan said that we can forget about the private sector. That is not entirely true. We are a physician body that's happy to sign the service level agreement, but there's an intermediary and that's discovery. And discovery was meant to contact us to sign some sort of agreement, but we can only accept a patient if we've got nursing staff and beds, you know, we can have 2000 ventilators. They're meaningless without staff. Um, and, and, and that's just all I want to say, that, that we have an incredible um, um, uh, physician body and we're all happy to help and work together, but just give us, we're, we're happy to contribute in every possible way, but don't knock the private sector. Um, I think just understand there are many, many surgeons uh, that cannot work right now. They're not earning an income. They've got staff that cannot be paid. So uh, the general practitioners are out of work. Uh, many of them have to close their practices and they need financial aid. And also the general practitioners have been coming to the hospitals and they've been helping us and that's the private sector and they're doing it for free. And then social workers in the private sector, the palliative care workers, they come out, they donate their hours, doing all this work for free. So that's just my little 
moment on a soapbox. Um, apologies. I, there was another question, Lydia. <laughs> I'm completely lost. My no, that's that's fine, Helen. Thanks very much. I think the and thank you for bringing that perspective in, and it's 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 valid. Um, and that's partly why we're having this kind of conversation. I think the second part was what what are the pressures been like in terms of triaging patients into your high cares and ICUs? Are you feeling similar kinds of pressures for beds that has been experienced in the public sector? Yes, we have the same pressures, but we also. Um, won't ventilate, you know, that we, we basically triage, triage our very sick patients uh, right in the EC and then also determine, look at their frailty score and whether they would qualify for ICU care or not. Thus far, we've been able to accommodate patients. Unfortunately, once they're ventilated, they stay for three, four weeks. And our biggest challenge at the moment is actually um, not so much... Uh, prevention of COVID transmission in these ICU to healthcare worker staff, but it's actually nosocomial um, transmission of pan-resistant gram-negative uh, pathogens. So week three, week four, they're getting uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias or lion sepsis with pan-resistant or gram-negative organisms that are unfortunately in our ICUs as well. And that's our biggest threat later down the line. And that's an enormous challenge. Um, because it's, there's a lot of transfer happening because we're proning the patients and your IPC between patients is challenging sometimes with of um, nursing ratio, nursing to patient ratios, etc. So um, that is becoming a challenge. Um, but at the moment, if you, um, I know I, I'm not 100% um, I, currently got COVID, I mentioned it, but I know, should I get sick, I've got a place in, in an ICU and a good team caring for me, a tired team, but a good team. And I know I have that guarantee, but that is not for everyone, you know, and I, I know that we can access those resources and I'm, I regard myself as extremely fortunate and lucky. Um, and luckily we can still um, uh, provide uh, that, that service. Um, but it's not unlimited numbers. And as I mentioned, we, we have staffing issues. Um, we lack uh, nurses and skilled nurses. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for sharing that uh, quite personal perspective as well. Um, I, I think what I'd like to do is to end off with a short comment from all the panelists um, about an overarching issue. I'll just try and start my video, um, which seems to be the, the need for, for us to, to look at how we, we bring together some kind of universal protocol um, that crosses provinces, hospitals, sectors. Um, do we need something like that? Is, does it exist already? How far apart are we? Can I just get some thoughts on that and, and how we might take that forward? And then we'll end with Kuni giving us some closing remarks. So uh, maybe we can start with, uh, with Greg and then we can just um, work our way down the list. Thanks. Okay, you started with me last time as well, Lydia. That's a bit unfair. Um, Look, I think that an overarching protocol is tricky because um, of the issue of uh, the private sector's access to in investigational products. Like um, we've seen on the group that, that people like Audrey Cock have, have got experience with Tocilizumab. I think we much more governed by um, uh, namely, firstly, cost and also access to some of these therapies. Um, I think we should still try and work as much as possible within the evidence framework. Um, and I think that a unified protocol would probably be um, just for some of the, um, uh, you know, m more mainstream and accepted form of therapies while obviously having to make provision for individual practitioners and, um, and, and what they decide to do with their own individual patients in the private sector. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, um, Nisha, can I have a view from, from you? Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, over, you know, I think, you know, I helped prepare a, um, a sort of acute response document and it was kind of the general principles. It was based on a lot of what the ICU had done in terms of preparation from an ICU response. And we adapted that from an inpatient response. Um, I did, I mean, I've shared that with some people and I, believe it's kind of gone to national to kind of look at some of the elements of 
So I think that I think the general principles are there, but as 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 Greg's indicated, you know, the, the specifics of 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 you know standardizing treatment and approach. I think I think we it's it's really difficult. You know, we we've been we've been scratching our heads about the differences. You know, just in terms of our, our stats. Um, you know, the the, the sub district with the leading numbers in terms of infections. You know, based on you know the testing has been the Tigerberg subdistrict, but with one of the lowest mortalities. Now, Tigerberg subdistrict is not it's not it's not just Tigerberg Hospital. It's you know there's an, there's Colbrema Hospital that also you know drains some of that, and there's overlap in terms of where patients flow, but still, I mean, in terms of looking at the absolute numbers of infections versus the deaths from coming out of this area is vastly different to say the Clifton and the Kailicha. And, and the differences in, in other sub-districts of the province, you know, um, the, the Western sub-district with, with another informal settlement has got also large numbers of infections, but not significant numbers presenting to hospital, you know, to the drainage, to, to the regional hospital that drains that area. You know, I'm talking about the Danun area. And the feeling is that it, th there's different, there's different popular uh, characteristics of different sub uh, parts of the city so Danun being a very new settlement with a younger population whereas your Klipfontein Kailicha are very well established townships and areas within Cape Town with a much higher non-communicable disease burden and a much higher um, a number of elderly patients uh, which is you know what we've been seeing you know that the, the the, the deaths um, that we've seen in the Western Cape, 50, on average, it's 50% have been uh, diabetic. So, so, you know, depending on, 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 on the situation and what your, what your um, uh, populations look like, you're likely to have, you know, different characteristics of your epidemic. Thanks, so thanks, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to say this is the standardized thing you should do across the board. I think it's um, more the principles of the response. Okay, um, Ayanda, a brief comment from your side. Um, should we have try and aim for something that we do like that? No, look, I mean, I, I also tend to agree with uh, what Greg has, um, has mentioned as well with Nishad. I think it's going to be it's going to be very cha challenging, not impossible, but I think there's a lot of issues at play. Um, that needs to be considered, but yeah, I think it's going to be quite challenging. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Usha. Could I? <laughs> Can they ask me? Can't see you. Okay, coming, 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 coming. 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 Um, I don't know what um, start video. Yeah. Okay. So Sorry. Yeah, I'll, 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 I mean, when it comes to treatment, um, I don't think, unfortunately, on this forum, time would allow all the treatment regimens. Um, uh, I mean, I, I saw there were questions about many aspects. Uh, we've been using steroids for quite a while, for example. We already started in April. Initially, we tried to get out of dexamethasone, but unfortunately, it's restricted to um, oncology until recently, at least. Then we used hydrocortisone, methylprednisone. So that's one aspect of the disease management. Other thing is obviously the clotting. Um, I saw on the group there's discussions about uh, low molecular weight heparin. We've been quite aggressive as far as that is concerned. Even if the D dimers are not that high, we've been doing it. Antiplatelet therapy, difficult. We're giving aspirin. We Swiss, we've been, we're not that keen on clopidogrel at the moment, but I don't want to go into any more detail. We have thrombolized quite a few patients based on clinical and echo evidence. Unfortunately, scanning them is practically impossible. General support, uh, we're giving vitamin C, thiamine, at quite high doses, vitamin D. We tried so some on polygam. Yeah, polygam well. we've tried. Um, we're running them slightly wet for those of you who are... Uh, yeah, so uvolemic at least. Because we traditionally, ARDS patients, um, we, we, we almost never give maintenance uh, fluid, whereas in these patients, we often find that if you don't, they become pre-renal. Um, and then obviously resource allocation, we, we did not discuss this. Um, it, it's a huge issue. Um, I think if I can prepare any uh, other provinces, you, you're gonna have to be prepared to take tough decisions. 
um, and on a regular basis and, and withdraw therapy where it's futile. Um, and what we found, what, it, what works well is to do it as a group. And we've, we've spoken about teamwork, but when it comes to either allocating a resource or, or not uh, to a patient or withdrawal of futile therapy, it's always best to take that as a group. Uh, often you're a bit tired and you don't want to take life and death decisions when you're overworked and you've got brain strain. So I think the best is always to bounce it off at least um, two other experienced clinicians. Um, I think that about summarizes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kuni. Um, I think, um, Helen, I don't know if you want to, to comment on this and well, not so much the detail, but the, the need for us to work towards something that is a, a general guide that everyone follows mostly. Um, I think we have good guidance and we have really smart people in South Africa and I think we need to stick to, to our national guidelines. They're good, they're evidence-based and yes, we, we adapt them and they will adapt as we get more information that's becoming av available from randomized controlled trials. Um, so lots of observational studies done and so on and I think if, you know, on a broader, if you want to treat uh, large populations, you really have to, to focus on evidence-based. Um, and then just lastly, I think with everything we do, and most important, we must never forget, forget um, our own humanity and, and just remain kind and, and uh, not be too critical with each other and support each other because we all need each other. We're a small community of healthcare workers and it's going to get a lot tougher than it is right now. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Helen. That's a lovely note to end on. I'm going to hand over to Glenda now. Yeah, I mean, I think that is wonderful. And thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, I do think we need a further conversation about uh, a common protocol and some of the constraints that we found in the, in the public sector and how we can bridge the divide between the public and private. You know, we want to aspire for excellence and, um, and that we want to make sure that wherever you are, in whatever sector, you get the best care and try to understand and how we solve this gap. And um, I agree with Helen is that uh, we must not forget our humanity. And we, we're all doctors, we're all trained in the same universities, we all practice in the same hospitals. And um, we are brethren and we need to work together so that uh, patients in our country, either irrespective of whether they're in the public or the private sector, um, have, have the, uh, the right to the best access to health um, that we can achieve and attain. So on that, you know, I think we will speak further about a webinar on common protocols, but um, this has been a wonderful, the fact that you still got 310 people at 6.30 shows how wonderful um, this, this knowledge exchange is and that we will continue to do things like this. So Lydia, thank you uh, for helping me co-host this and thank the panelists are amazing. Um, and I salute you, uh, you know, I salute the work that you do and your commitment to the health of South Africans. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Glenda, for inviting us. And thanks to Patrick for um, setting this up and to the other panelists. It's been, it's been a great, great pleasure um, and also humbling experience. My side too as well, Glenda. Thank you very much for the um, invitation. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been awesome. And I think um, we're all in this together. Um, and I think uh, we just need to realize that uh, we just all need to stick together. And I think as the pandemic evolves, we also need to look at moving forward from um, the whole issue um, of sort of managing patients to an issue of staff um, and managing ourselves and our mental health care act and looking after each other and making sure that we've got um, a good sort of number of people um, who have started with us in the, in the pandemic are still with us as we, as we end, um, both from an emotional perspective, from a physical perspective. So yeah. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. I think we're going to close now. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.